Good evening. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Light of Life. I'm Vicar Jonah Schlomer. I'm the vicar out in West Lafayette, Indiana. And I'm in my third year at seminary, so I'm over there studying under Pastor Warren. It's a pleasure to be with you today. We'll begin as in our bulletin on page one.
is in the name of the Lord, the The maker maker of of heaven heaven and and earth. earth. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us, that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ. And in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Amen.
When I was in the pit of despair, Lord, you lifted me out. Though your anger blazed down on me because of my sin, you sent your Son to take the brunt of your anger so that I might be spared. Now I rejoice in the splendor of your grace and proclaim your saving deeds to those who will yet praise you as their only Savior. Amen. Our reading is Matthew chapter 26. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to you, all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to to God. God.
The reading that will serve for our ser- basis for our sermon is John chapter 12. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. There was much excitement throughout the vehicle as my family and I made our way towards Battleship, Texas. Now, my brothers and I had grown up in school learning about this great battleship that sat in the Texas harbor. And we had heard the stories about how this ship had served in both World War I and World War II, that it had only ever suffered one casualty throughout its years and years of service. And on top of it, we had talked to our friends and told them we were going to this battleship. And in their excitement, they couldn't help but share the the fun things you're able to do there. You're able to sit in the chairs of the turrets that that soldiers back in the day would have swiveled around on. You could explore the inner workings of a, a real World War II, World War I battleship and see how the crew would have lived. And as you can imagine, a, a group full of kids headed to, headed to a historic location, our imagination started running wild. We are imagining all these great heroic battles that this battleship must have gone through. All the great adventures it must have experienced. That by the time we got to Battleship Texas, we just poured out of that car and took off running towards that battleship. Now, of course, there was security at this battleship, so we had to wait at the gate for our parents to finally catch up. And when they did, my dad went up to the ticket booth and said, we would like to see the battleship. And like that, the gates were opened, and we are allowed to explore every nook and cranny of that great old battleship. And maybe you have a similar story about excitement, about the buildup, about finally getting the the thing you wanted or finally getting to a location and getting to experience something. And I can't help but think that the Greeks in our reading for tonight must have had a very similar excitement. Because they had heard the stories. This was Jesus of Nazareth, the one who had turned water into wine, The one who, with just a few words, had calmed a raging storm on the Sea of Galilee. The one who healed the sick, who 
who cured people of their diseases, who cast out demons, and even raised people from the dead. We put ourselves in their shoes, we can feel that excitement, can't we? Of finally getting to see Jesus. And then in our story, we have, have them go to Philip, which might seem interesting to us. But we have to keep in mind, these were, were Greeks. They were the, the Gentiles that is so often talked about in Holy Scripture. The ones who were outside of, of God's people, right? The ones who had spent their whole life on the outside looking in. And that's not just an expression. They, there was actually a gate at the temple that they weren't allowed past, and inside that gate, that's where all the Jewish people went to worship, and they had to stay outside of the gate of the temple to worship God. They literally were on the outside looking in. And so when Philip goes to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip talk it over and then go to Jesus, Jesus' words might, might surprise us, but maybe didn't surprise the Greeks so much. They were used to hearing words that they might not fully understand because they were often on the outside looking in. And so when they heard the words from Jesus, when he, when he starts telling them about how the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, And then he goes into a, a parable of sorts where he starts talking about kernels of wheat. He says if a kernel of wheat doesn't die, it, it remains only one seed, but if it dies, it produces many. And then he says maybe the hardest words in this whole section, whoever loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it. For eternal life. Now the Greeks were, were used to hearing the strange words sometimes and not understanding it. So judging by their reaction of going to Philip before approaching Jesus, they probably had some, some feelings of unworthiness of even approaching their Messiah. And that's a similar way of of how we sometimes feel, is it not? We all know our, our sins. The ones that, that haunt us day and night are sometimes so hard for us to not fall into. We, the truth is, we love our lives on this earth full of sin. And the things that we love about this life is is really getting what, what, what we deserve. When, we, when we, we love to take what we deserve, when we work really hard at work, and, and outwork everybody else, we, we deserve that raise. We love to get that raise. When we are working on a project or an event, we love to receive praise after our hard work on that event finally pays off and everybody sees how great of an event it is. We love to, we love to receive, receive the love and affection from our spouse when we've finally done everything they've asked for us, asked of us to do. We love our lives of sin on this world sometimes. But that begs the next question. What happens when we don't deserve the race? When we're outworked at work? What happens when we don't deserve the praise? Because even though we put our best effort into it, at the end of the day, the, the end result was less than ideal. What happens when we don't deserve 
the love and affection of our spouse or, or anybody else that we have a relationship with. Because like in all of our relationships, we so often fail one another. What happens when the secret, our secret, finally gets out that we are rotten sinners? Our only option left is to come humbled, subdued, guilt-ridden to our God and say, we would like to see Jesus. Because Jesus is the one we need to see. We don't need a God who gives us what we deserve because we all know that what we deserve is, is something far worse. No, we need Jesus, the one who is that dead colonel for us. The one who went to the cross, took all of our sins on himself, died for them, so that he can make each and every one of you and me children of God. This is who you and I are in, in Christ. We have a Savior who we can dump all of our sins on and let him die, and, and he goes and dies for them on the cross, burying them there forever. The reason that Jesus gave this response to the Greeks is because he knew how hard it was going to be to save their lives. At first, these words might seem somewhat out of nowhere from Jesus. But when this event happens, it's actually on the Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus is very much looking towards the end of that week where he will finally have to go on that cross and die. And he says it in, in his words for tonight. He says that, that his soul was tormented. That he was questioning, letting the... He, was, he, was, he asked the question if he should pa let this cup pass from him. But his response is a resounding no. And he says it's for this very reason that he was there to die for our sins. He says that he does, he's doing this to glorify the Father's name. And in one of those beautiful moments where the Father and Son converse, we see that they're very much on the same page, and the Father responds by saying, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And how the Father is going to glorify his name again is by letting his son go to that cross and die. Jesus uses imagery to say that, Jesus uses the imagery in these verses to say that when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Now those words would have instantly struck a very familiar image in those listeners that day. What he's referring back to is that, that story about Moses and the people of Israel in the wilderness. Snakes were sent on the people of Israel for rebelling against God. And as these snakes bit the people, they were dying. And they cried out to God and God gave them a way for salvation. He had Moses build a bronze snake and put it on a pole and raise it above where all the people of Israel could see it. And whoever looked to that snake was healed and saved. That is exactly what Jesus was going to do at the end of this week. He was going to be raised up on, to, on a cross, suffer torment and die. But not just physical torment, the, the torment Jesus was contemplating was, was, eternal, was eternal separation from his Father. 
That, the kind of pain that we've never experienced on this earth because we always have God's presence with us. But he was contemplating doing that. And, and not only that, we tremble at the thought of just suffering for one sin that we've committed. Jesus was contemplating the punishment for all sins. An uncountable number. But he knew that this, is, this was the way. This was the way for his Father to be glorified. This was the way so that he could save the life that you have in him. Maybe not the life that, that we think we always want, but it was the life that God was going to give to each and every one of you and me as children of God. He died for your sins so that the life that Jesus for you could, saw for you could be yours. And in our question to, to come to God and say we would like to see Jesus, instead of the, the response Jesus gives us is that Jesus sees you. He sees who you are in Christ. Children of God. That's how God sees you. And that's how Jesus sees you. Amen.
Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and Merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. God bless you as we continue our lives as children of God.